Good morning, church. Great to see you. Welcome to May 8th. It is, it's turned out to be a good one. The sun is out for the first time in like years, it feels like. So welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome, whether you're joining us live or live stream, no matter where you are on life's journey or your journey of faith, you are welcome here. We are Medina United Church of Christ Congregational, welcoming, loving, and serving for 200 And three years, we're hoping for 203 more. And thanks to you, this day, your presence being the church, I think we'll do all right. We'll make it. We'll make it. With a good word of welcome is the Reverend Harry Buck. Good morning. I have a quick announcement, and that has to do with the choir you see sitting back here. They've been serving this congregation all year, and on May 22nd, they will be concluding their service until the fall. So, we are looking for people who could contribute their own musical talents during the summer for special music. In the hallway, there's a sign-up sheet. Uh, I invite you to add your name, singing, playing an instrument, tap dancing, whatever you have, we'd love to see you up here to contribute to the worship service. There will be a piece in the newsletter and the worship bulletin next week with more details. Thank you. We welcome you and your musical talent. Well done, well done. My friends, as we gather, it is good to just rest, close your eyes, maybe drop your chin a little bit. Strengthen and lengthen your back, drop your shoulders away from your ears. Let that space just happen. Feel supported by the pew. It has held others and it can hold you. You're right where you need to be. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Deep breath in again. Let it out with a sigh. Ah. Our first prayer together, a prayer of Ruach, prayer of peace. May we lift our chin, look around to our neighbors, see who is gathered, and raise a sign of peace and say, Hey, neighbor, good to see you. Peace be with you. My friends, let us rise in body or spirit and sing our opening hymn.
please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. scripture this morning comes to us the 23rd psalm you can find it on page 474 in your pew bible the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul he leads me in right paths for his name's sake even though i walk through the darkest valley i fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And from the 10th chapter of John, verses 22 to 30. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. 
and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. I invite the children to join me up front. Good morning. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, thank you, everybody. I think these kids are asleep up here. All right, so it is a special day today. What today what is today? Mother's Day. Did you guys get mom a card? Um, I got mama a card. You got mama a card? Yeah. You made mama a card? It had glitter on it. Oh, that may, pink and purple glitter, the best. Pink and purple glitter, the best. And I bet you've told mommy you love her a bunch, huh? Because we all love our moms, right? And all the women in our lives, right? You tell her? Yeah. And she loves to hear that. She loves to hear that you love her. But she also loves when you show her that you love her. What are some things that you could do to show her that you love her? What do you think? Give her kisses, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Hugs. Hugs, yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah. Help around the house. Oh, my goodness, that would be amazing. Help around the house. What are some other things you could do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other ideas? Help around the house. Clean your room. You clean your toy area? That's awesome. What about don't fight with your siblings? <gasps> that's a good one. Yeah, that's, look at Laura and Leah looking at each other. <laughs> so there's all kinds of things that we can do to show mom that we love her, right? And so sometimes, you remember when I talked about, you know, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk? Kind of that same type of thing, right? We can tell mom we love her, and, and she knows that we love her, but it's good to show mom how much we love her, too, by helping her out and doing things, because she does so much for us, right? She feeds us, drives us places, cheers us on at our games and, and our mama, concerts. But mama can drive her car, and, and her car is broken. Oh, her car's broken, so she can't drive it right now? Okay. Well, maybe you have another car she could drive around, huh? Yeah. Car is already fixed. Oh, it's already fixed. Fantastic. All right. So. These cars are Yeah. Okay, great. So you have two cars. That's awesome. All right. So, and just like mom taking care of us, you know, God takes care of us because we are all God's children, right? God takes care of us. And just like showing mom how much we love her, we can show God how much we love God. What are some things we can do to show God? Walk on the walk. I mean, talk, yeah, walk on the walk and not talk on the talk. What can we do? This is the quietest you guys have ever been. I just want to say, I feel like I'm... What are some things you can do? Help me out, Brendan. What can you do to show God that, show God that you love God? What can we do? You have ideas. Oh, thank you, Bobby. What? Pray. Yes. Laura, what was your idea? Oh, you're just doing that to... to show Bobby off. Yeah. I show mom my dance moves. You show mom your dance moves. She loves that too. Yes. All right. Well, we're going to say a prayer and we're going downstairs and we're going to talk more about this because I feel like we could be up here a long time. 
All right? So let's say a prayer, and then we'll go downstairs, and we're going to talk more about this and some other fun things, okay? All right. Yes, we're going to the dino room. All right, ready? Dear God, we thank you for our moms and all the amazing women in our lives. Bless them this day and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Now let's say the prayer that Jesus taught us just a minute. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let's go downstairs. Bye. gather now our joys and concerns as is our tradition here. The list is long. If you have a name to add or an update, please see me following the service. We lift up Jim Schaefer, Greg Schaefer's brother, still dealing with cancer. We lift up Greg himself as he had a fall, as did Ruth Sinclair, both bruised but doing well, resting, ice, and uh, relaxation for them both. We lift up Glenn, the uncle of Ryan Billicum, with some health concerns. For Judy Dawson at Medina Meadows, along with Diana Hunter at Brookdale South, blessings for them. For Bob Phillips, friend of Cindy Karecki, son-in-law of Nate, um, there's a mass found on the bladder, and there will be testing done. We lift up our own Virginia Jondervan, who fell here last Sunday and is heading to rehab soon. We pray, pray for her. For Claire, who we've been praying for, a five-year-old struggling with leukemia, who is getting um, a second opinion at Nationwide, as uh, she is quite sick. So we pray for Claire in this time and for her family. We pray for first responders. Uh, there has been a rash of injuries and an uptick in accidents. Uh, as the weather is getting nicer and we're starting to move more, we're seeing more accidents. So take it easy out there. Don't text and drive. I judge you, please don't do that. Um, and also to help out our already stretched first responders. And I have a confession, church. Um, it's, it's, I am human. And so as I'm uh, heading over to our lovely uh, county auditor mailbox to, to mail something and pick up my laptop, there are a ton of fire trucks. And I'm like, what is happening to the church? And then I realized the smoke that I'm seeing is not coming from the church. And I said, oh, thank God. <laughs> You're hearing, you're hearing it, right? You're hearing it. Oh, but, oh God, sorry for the, sorry for who is on fire. So it was the CPA building right over across the street. Um, everything seems to be contained. The firefighters, I pray, have done their due diligence and did awesomely as they always do. But prayers for them and for uh, whatever was going on over there at the house. We lift up the light, lives of Hilda Colon, Tony's mom, who died on April 27th, and again, Rachel Evans, who died on May the 3rd, whose service will be here Friday the 13th. Blessings to Rachel and for all who mourn. For family, I got to spend time with my sisters, Roberta, uh, Bobby, and Carrie, and uh, we welcomed uh, her son, Garrett and Megan's new uh, bebe into the world, so welcome to Jackson, um, and we threw a, a diaper party yesterday. It was wonderful to, to be there. Uh, we also want to welcome Nora Claire Ciula, born on May the 3rd, proud parents of Allie and Vince. Grandparents are Lori and Dave, so blessing to Lori and Dave uh, Ciula Glover, and welcome to Nora Claire, and welcome, and we're so happy to all the birthdays on the lists for Kyle Root. Elizabeth Mason, Pat Hofsetter, Katie Morgan, Joe Tereshko, Kelsey Stoll, Lori Storch, Bobby Nolan, Zach Bennett, Diane Howard, and Olivia Miller. The flowers on the communion table are for the anniversary of Matt and Stacy Yates. You two lovebirds, yay for you. 
We want to lift up our crafts in the welcoming area. You can take one to make a new friend or strengthen a tie that bind. Please pick one up as you're uh, heading out today. Also, sign up for our Garfield families to feed them, bring in some food. Uh, we want to lift up that your generosity uh, in the name of Jackie Smith. You have donated $2,800 to keep this beloved ministry going. It's going to take a break for the summer because our families are scattering. They're going elsewhere to camp and camp grandparents and all this so we w they won't be around for the food but we'll pick it back up in the fall and so just a few Sundays left if you haven't done yourself this is a good challenge no no takers come on guys dying up here um, yeah so do that also we want to lift up the youth blessing bags and for the wisdom and teaching of Jan Simmons just a local treasure You'll find some brown bag uh, downstairs that you can take to one of five, seven, five, five, five area uh, feed food banks here. And this is, these are meals ready to go that our kids pack with love and care. Uh, so big thanks to the Jesus Vibes, to our youth group who packed, and for Jan Simmons being the gift that she is. We lift up prom happened last night, so blessings to all those recovering, sleeping in late for our Costa Rican Rica trip and for Mother's Day for all who celebrate. So let us now gather in a spirit of prayer. We turn to you, our God, you who longs to gather us as a mother hen gathers her chicks, for we are divided and we don't know what to do, what steps to take, and we are scattered. So maybe on this day we can find common ground, for we are all born of mothers. And we pray for the mothers in our lives. We pray for those who have a wonderful relationship with their mom. We pray for those who are estranged. For those who are grieving their mom this day. For those who wanted to be moms and never could. For those who brought life into this world by other means, for the aunts and foster moms, grandmas, grannies, stepmoms, surrogate moms, all who nurtured us. We pray also for our mother church, the place where our faith took root, where we had become, first become aware of the concerns beyond our immediate family, where we first heard the gospel stories, and were taught what it means to love one another as I have loved you place where we make lifelong friends with whom we continue to face the challenges of earning a living, maintaining a family, and of growing old. And for some of us, the creeds and traditional expressions of the faith no longer make sense, yet we still value the church community as a spiritual home, a space where we can encounter and experience the mystery of grace. For our Mother Earth, the habitat of humanity, we pray for her healing for the sake of the mothers of future generations. Holy One, remind us again of the work and joy of being connected to each other. And so again, we humbly resolve to affirm and encourage each other to live fully in a spirit of authenticity and service. We pray in Jesus' name, born of a woman, reminded of your challenge and your inspiration and your love for all your children. Amen. So, my friends, I start this sermon with great trepidation, for I believe, as Bishop Gene Robinson says, it's funny, isn't it, that you can preach a judgmental, vengeful, and angry God, and no one will mind. But you start preaching a God that is too accepting, too loving, too forgiving, too merciful, too kind, well, then you're in trouble. So for five years, from this pulpit, I have given you my honest and informed opinion on things, and I'm always open to dialogue and correction, so buckle up, here we go. It was the late spring of 2011 when I walked into a Christian bookstore. One of my favorite authors had just released a book, and I was hoping to grab it there as I had many other books from this particular store, but I couldn't find it, nor could I find any of his other books. So I ask at the front desk, do you have Love Wins by Rob Bell? <laughs> the look that I got, if looks could kill, 
wouldn't be here today speaking to you. But the teller recovered her composure and said, no, but we can order it for you. I'm like, is, is something wrong? Is it, is it me? What's, what just happened? What took place? Well, yes, uh, frankly. Do you believe what he says in his book, she asked. And I said, I don't know what he says in his book because I'm hoping to buy it here. What does he say? Well, he says that hell doesn't exist. If there's no hell, there's no need for Jesus. I was puzzled, so I walked out puzzled without the book. And I got it later on. I had no idea what was going on. Rob Bell, who planted a church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, he grew it from nothing to 5,000. He did so with his first sermon series on the book of Leviticus. If this man can make Leviticus interesting and grow a church from nothing to 5,000, he's worth listening to. So he wrote all these books. He produced the NUMA video series that I commend to you. He was thoughtful, approachable. He was the darling of the church world for a while, including in 2007 when he was named one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world. But after Love Wins was published, there was a vicious backlash. The full title of the book is Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who has ever lived. The book states that some versions of Jesus should be rejected, especially those used to intimidate and inspire fear in people. Bell advises readers to reject the armchair style of religion that lazily believes everyone and everything outside of its circle gets thrown into hell if they don't conform to every bullet point of belief. Bell uses the scriptures, like the story of the prodigal son who receives a ring and a robe and a hug and a party from his dad instead of a lecture. Bell also points out how many early Christians believed in a concept called universalism, which states that if God wants everyone saved and in heaven, then God gets what God wants. Love wins. But this was apparently too much for some people. Apparently, heaven isn't heaven without some people being tortured for all time. Typically, the people who need a hell are the same ones convinced that they won't be in it. <laughs> Universalism dates all the way back to the first century. From the get-go, Early theologians like Origen and Clement of Alexandria and Gregory of Nyssa talk about a word called apokastasis that some of us say when we sneeze. Apokastasis is that Greek term that means universal restitution, restoration. And this is a doctrine in the Orthodox Church. And some theologians state that God will give us eternal second chances even after we die. The hope is that there will come a time where evil will be fully defeated and no more. It's also right in the Apostles' Creed. I was taught in my Catholic school that the Apostles' Creed was the first creed, that each of the 12 precepts come from one of the 12 apostles who contributed to the formation of the creed. That's a lovely tradition, and if that's what you believe, great, but the story doesn't quite check out. We, we ran the DNS, DNA tests and we see that it's first mentioned in the Synod of Milan dating to 390 Common Era. It's been used heavily in the Latin Rite since the 8th century. The Emperor Charlemagne loved the creed so much it became the official creed of the Holy Roman Empire. It contains the phrase in Latin, descendant ad inferos, he descended into hell. It's not found in the Nicene Creed. It is referenced in Ephesians 4, 9 through 10. Jesus ascended, what does it mean, but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the all heavens, so he might fulfill all things. It's a mysterious bit of writing that Paul has for us. And the early church picked up that that must mean he descended into hell. We know what Jesus did throughout Holy Week for the most part, how he was teaching in and around Jerusalem, how he was in the upper room on Thursday, went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was betrayed by Judas and arrested. 
He went on trial and was passed around from religious authorities to Herod to Pilate all Thursday evening and into Good Friday, and then was found guilty, beaten, made to carry the cross. He was crucified on that Friday between noon and 3. At 3 p.m. he died and rose again on Easter Sunday. But what happened on Saturday? It's an interesting question. The early church held that Jesus went down and wrecked hell. It's called the harrowing of hell. It is referred to not just in the Apostles' Creed, but also the Athanasian Creed and interpreted in 1 Peter 4, verse 6. Good tidings were proclaimed to the dead. All of these to point to the harrowing of hell. The idea being Jesus went down brought salvation to the souls held captive since the beginning of time or whenever the devil took control of the earth, whatever came first. It's not explicit in the Bible either. But this doctrine was mentioned by many of the early church theologians as well as many non-canonical books that didn't make it into the Bible. Now, many disagree with this idea. You might be there too. That's fine. There is absolutely nothing in the Gospels about what happened on Holy Saturday, and we go by the Bible. Jesus was in the tomb. The writers are silent as to what he was doing in that time. That's fine. Okay. Some Protestant reformers even say that the phrase descended into hell refers to Christ's pain and humiliation prior to his death, and that makes a lot of sense to me. We put Jesus through hell in that trial and leading up to the cross. St. Augustine argued 1 Peter Chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, the chief passage used to support the doctrine of the harrowing of hell is, quote, more allegory than history, end quote. And there are just some folks who are just flat out against it. And that's fine. That's okay. I'm sure you have your reasons. I'm, you don't have to be sure of this doctrine either. But I preach it to you now so you know of the congrega- conversation that has happened. I would not keep you ignorant of it. It is a robust conversation and it is still happening. What I can't stand and cannot abide is those who overlook church history and this conversation and just jump to, I'm right. But what about, no, (laughs) you don't need any of that history. You just need to listen to what I say. That's not the congregational way because it produces people and believers like that woman in that Christian bookstore without reading a book will condemn it. So you're saying there's no hell? No. After reading the book, that's not what Rob Bell is saying. That's not what the early church theologians and supporters of universalism up till Rob Bell are saying. They're not saying that there isn't a hell. They're saying the good news is Jesus wrecked the place. That death itself has been defeated. They are not denying that there isn't any judgment of God, nor are they not stating that there aren't any ethics here and now or rules of behavior to live by or any of that. What this doctrine does for me, church, is it keeps me from saddling up my moral high horse and riding it around too often. Because I can be a bit ethically rigid. I love to set standards for myself and I beat myself up when I don't meet them and maybe you do this too and then we make the mistake of holding our neighbors up to our own expectations and judge them when they don't meet them without ever getting to bother to know their story and how they see the world this way of life is exhausting and it has cost me a lot of friendships it has harmed relationships within my own family it has been a hard way to be in the world and I have gotten marginally better thanks to your work and this doctrine. Because for me, universalism reminds me that God is in charge of salvation and I am not. I would hope that God is more creative than I am. It's easy for me to judge people and then damn them to eternal torment. But have we really considered how long eternity is? Maybe you haven't, so let's sing a little song. We were taught when we were little, infinity bottles of beer on the wall, infinity bottles of beer. Take a billion down, pass them around, infinity bottles of beer on the wall. Infinity is a very long time. So you'd think an eternal, infinite, compassionate God would see us, each of us, as more than the worst thing we have ever done. 
and then a loving God would not condemn us to infinite torment for our ignorant mortal mistakes because the math doesn't add up. We get a hundred years or less to do our best to be like Christ to the world and we're guaranteed eternal hellfire for each mistake. Doesn't sound like good news. Like how big of a mistake? Like not recycling, jaywalking? What, what are we talking? How good do we have to be? Oh, and we can't earn our way into heaven with our good deeds, but we can earn our way to hell with our bad deeds? That is a rigged game. And you will lose 100% of the time. And it doesn't sound like Jesus, who in the entire chapter 10 of John's gospel talks about, I am the good shepherd. Echoing Psalm 23, that comforting psalm we read at each and every funeral. And need reminded in times of comfort, I at least turn to it all the time, that the Lord is our shepherd. And he guides us on right paths. And sometimes, being a stupid sheep, we wander off. But the God in Christ said he will leave the 99 and come find each one of us and make us lie down in green pastures and set a table before us and anoint our head with oil and our cup will overflow. We are good enough for God. And God's faithfulness and grace are not okay, or they're not meh, or they're not just all right. They are amazing. Certainly beyond what I would do with my human tendency for petty revenge. I mean, if I knew I had one night to live, what would, what would you do? You had one night to live. Hey, tomorrow night you're gone. What would you do? For me, it would be a massive party. All bets are off. <laughs> Jaywalking all over the place. Set the standards low. You can have a lot of fun. That's what I would do. But Jesus at the Last Supper knew he had one more day. And what did he do? Washed feet fed his disciples and commanded them to love. Then he spent the night in prayer in a garden until he was arrested. That is simply divine. God's ways are not my ways, and I am so thankful for that. For last Sunday, we spoke about the grace Jesus gave Simon Peter. Peter, who denied him three times by a charcoal fire, is restored three times by a charcoal fire. The works Jesus did in God's name are why I believe. The good news of God's grace and love are what Jesus taught and died for and came back and lived following his resurrection. That's what I want to be a part of this flock. And I want that for everyone. You and me, every nation, creed, everything, every everything needs to know about this good news that they are loved here and now, that you can find heaven here and now at home in this world. The picture on your bulletin cover is a Chinese Christ comforting a disciple at the Last Supper, and I find great comfort in this depiction. I think I can see myself in each one of the disciples here, the one seemingly asleep that Jesus is comforting, the guy who is left in the black and the blue praying or contemplating, the one pleading with him in the green and there Jesus saying, this is my body, offering himself, offering comfort and salvation. And he does so on the cross, because where in your theology does the thief live? As Jesus was hanging up there, that we put him up there, and the guy, one of the thieves, says, hey, hey Jesus, you think I can get a little bit of that heaven? Jesus is like, yeah. Today, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. Where does that feature in? To our prayers and understanding of God. It's been a long road for me to accept that I'm accepted. That I'm accepted by the source of all life. And it is my mission in life to spread that around. I want to act like Christ. 
welcome the outcast and protect the orphan and widow and welcome the stranger, for some have entertained angels unaware. And I want to sit with you and learn for each of your life stories so you and I can figure out what our still-speaking God is up to in our world and find Christ in one another. I trust Jesus with all my heart, mind, and strength. I love the Lord's Prayer, especially the part that says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then Christians, I take it to mean, are committed to more heaven and less hell. We are opposed to hell in every and any form. And we pray that one day there will be no one in hell. It will be destroyed like the choir sung so beautifully up here. That with God, all things are possible. And if God wants it, God will get it, for God's love is ultimately irresistible. If it's not true, then God is not all-powerful. And we're saying God can't do something. Or we're also saying God can't get what God wants, and that Jesus' death on the cross didn't cover it. It wasn't good enough. And I, for one, don't think I can place that limit on God Jesus' life, teachings, and atonement on the cross. I love the theological imagination that because of Jesus' love for us, he descended into hell and wrecked the joint. Or that in his love, he suffered our humiliation and violence and returned it with love and forgiveness and new life. For that is what God's kingdom is built on, the foundation of love with Jesus Christ alone being the cornerstone. It is like The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King stated, Love is the most durable power in the world. Centuries ago, Jesus started an empire that was built on love, and even to this day, millions will die for him. Who can doubt the veracity of these words? For great military leaders of the past have gone, and their empires have crumbled and burned to ashes. But the empire of Jesus, built solidly and majestically on the foundation of love, is still growing. I have seen hell in my life. I've experienced a little of the hell of poverty and how it's a crime to be poor in this country. I have seen the hells of addiction, of mental health, of isolation, of the unfair judgment and dehumanization of whole groups of people. I hate it because I have seen it. And because I have seen it, I hate it, and I want less of it in the world. And I think you do too, church. I think Jesus does. If we are to walk by faith and not by sight, I don't need to have any faith in hell. I'm certain it exists. I've seen it. It's real. It exists. What I don't see, and I need faith in, is the power of love to get people out of hell. And I am surprised and astounded each time my faith is confirmed. How people can rally around a sick, grieving, or lonely person and how cards, food, and phone calls can brighten someone's day. That is how hell is harrowed. It is that easily defeated. And I have faith in that because I don't often see that in the headlines. I know how my snap judgments try to snatch people out of God's hand and cast all people I don't like into hell, and I don't need faith in that. I see it, and I live that every day, just like I'm rounding the corner, and I see the fire trucks not here. Oh, thank God. Yeah, but where is the burning hell? It's across the street. Why could I pray for that? Nothing can snatch us out of the hands of our loving God. I hope that God is not as petty as I am. And I have faith in that. And I'd like to see the world one day as God does. For I'd like to believe that I would never look upon a face of a person whom God does not love. Here I stand and can do no other. Amen.
Forgive our lack of faith, O God. We give in faith and trust to this church for the benefit of our neighbors in need. Guide our time, talent, and treasure, we humbly ask. Hear your children as we rise in body or spirit and make a joyful noise to you. Seven, 
and then we'll break for the summer. We'll come back maybe in the fall and we'll do Rob Bell's Leviticus. Why not? See what he has to say about that book. Our annual meeting reminder that on the 22nd at 10, there will be one service. You're going to want to be here. One, for quorum. Two, for these reports to remind ourselves we had a banner year, folks. A banner year. It's amazing what you have done, what the miles we have covered. And because of this, we have some new members seeking to join us. We offer you new members classes on May the 16th at 7. We have such a great response because of you, church, that we'll be in Fellowship Hall due to the size. So keep up the great work. And now, before we join one another in the benediction, two more words. Coffee hour. <laughs> it's going to be glorious. Please join me in the benediction. Know that wherever you go, to the highest heavens, or we descend into hell, God is there with you each step of the way. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. We remember the promise that where I am, you shall also be. We have been blessed to be a blessing. We shall go from here with this good news. Go, for this service has ended, and our service now begins. Amen.